Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. Today we continue with neural networks. Maybe the important, most important topic in machine learning today. Um, as I said, machine learning is a way of automated programming. And for me, like the, the most general form of automated programming is for me this deep learning stuff because the deep learning is really you write a program with parameters and then by gradient descent you automatically tweak your program. That's it. So that's the most general way to think about it for me. All the other methods like support factor machine and lots of other, lots of other stuff that we talk about in machine learning of course is also important. But for me this neural network is like the, the most basic form where this idea is like nicely, um, nicely implemented. So Last time, I think we talked about um, backpropagation. So today we will talk about different building blocks, so different layers that we can put into our code. But before we do that, let's see now how we can use um, a toolbox like PyTorch for automatic differentiation for exactly the stuff that we did last time, okay? So let me switch to the... Um, to our network here. And again, the code is just like quick and dirty. So there are bugs and so you shouldn't rely on it. So sometimes the test error doesn't go down as much as we want. And sometimes there's problems with the shape. So this is the usual stuff. I will point out maybe some of the difficulties that run, I run into when I implemented this, okay? Ideally at the end, we will have an implementation of this Jan Lecun's Lynette for digit recognition. And it will be at the very bottom of this notebook. But let's again, let's start um, <clears throat> with the other stuff. So we started last time with the library NumPy, okay? And we implemented um, a digit recognizer based on NumPy function. So what was this implementation? So we initialized some random matrices and some random vectors here, which were the weight matrices and the biases. And then we had a little forward implementation, the one from the slide, I think that's already from last Monday, where we basically have these linear combination of all features plus bias, and then some nonlinearity that is applied component wise and just three times. Then we calculate base a residual and a squared error using this residual. So this is a simple implementation of the forward pass through a neural network, where typically the neural network ends it's the y, so that is the function we want to learn, the mapping from x to y here. But then to generate a meaningful gradient, we continue a little bit to calculate a scalar output that we can take the derivative with, with, uh, with to. And when you take the derivatives, you can derive expressions to calculate the gradients, as we did like two lectures ago, which were like these expressions here over there. So outer product between the residual and the output of the last hidden layer and so on and so forth. We went through those. Um, and when you have these gradients calculated, you can do gradient descent. So that is basically how you can implement your neural network. Now, last time we did automatic differentiation, which ideally would get rid of all this computation here. In particular, it will get rid of the mass so that we don't have to do it by hand. So ideally, um, when we really want to do automatic programming, we want to have a language or a toolbox where we can just write the forward pass like this stuff here. And then we say, please update the parameters, okay? With whatever gradients are necessary. And last time uh, we went through a couple of examples from these great slides from the Stanford people to show you that when we have a graph for this forward computation going from X to Y, then by going backwards through the graph, we are able to do to just compute all these gradients along the way locally. So all these computations that are done here that we worked out on a piece of paper can be done automatically if we just have an implementation of the forward pass. However, speaking of compilers, typically when you evaluate this code, this Python code, we have an eval function which like do, does this forward computation. So the eval function knows what to do for the plus. It knows what to do for this add sign and so on and so forth. Now, if you want to have as well the gradients, you need a more sophisticated evaluation function, which kind of keeps the computations as a graph and then runs backwards through it. And that's what a toolbox like PyTorch is doing. It's not only doing these operations here, but it's doing it in such a way that all these intermediate steps here 
um, are not just the matrix or a digit or something, but it's decorated with more stuff. So there are gradients paths and local gradients computed and all these things are cleverly combined. And in particular, the computation can not only be executed forward, but automatically also backwardly. Okay, and by this we then get the gradients for free. Ideally, then there's also a convenient mechanism to do the updates of the gradient descent here, and there, there will be. However, before we go into the automatic differentiation, let's translate this code with the um, Perpedis backward computation and the Perpedis gradient descent into PyTorch code without using any of the sophisticated mechanisms of the automatic differentiation. This might come a little bit to a surprise to you that that's possible, but in principle, um, similarly to say import NumPy, we can just do import torch and have also a full linear algebra toolbox that can do everything that the NumPy can do. So let's first use the torch in such a way as we use the NumPy library, okay? So that's our first step. So let's scroll to that one. So that is basically the multi-layer network as before, but now with the torch implementation. So of course, what we need is we need now the torch toolbox and not any more the NumPy toolbox. So and really to ensure that the NumPy is gone, let me reset my notebook, okay? So let's restart the kernel, okay? So now there's no NumPy in here anymore. Nothing is in, in here. And let me execute the first box. As you can see here, it's computing it, it's the one, okay? So there's nothing now loaded in here, but the torch toolbox and some other stuff that we need later. So the MNIST digits, before we were converting them after loading them to NumPy arrays, but I mean, Torch Vision sounds a little bit like Torch, right? And so this is all implemented in Torch actually. So what we did for our first example, we converted this data set from the Torch linear algebra format into the NumPy linear algebra format to use NumPy. However, now we want to use Torch. So we don't have to convert it. The only conversion that we need to do here is that the original digit data, I think they are integers or even unsigned integers or sometime, something like that. And for the computations here, we need them to be floating point numbers. Okay, that's why we have one conversion here to float. But all the other references to NumPy is, are gone. In particular, we had some, our own one hot encoding up here. Let me flip back how we did it. So where is it? It's up here, the code. Where we loaded the MNIST digits and first reference was here, we were converting it to NumPy arrays. And then we were also using a NumPy zeros vector to by hand to generate these one hot encodings, okay? Um, luckily in Torch, there's a function for that one. Yeah, and this function is contained in this Torch and end functional thing, which is commonly um, included as F, okay, that's just the convention that everyone is using. And then we can just say F dot one hot and we can convert basically the labels into a one hot encoded one. And of course we need the number of classes so that we know how large the vector is. And then finally, again, we need to transform those into floats. That's kind of relevant here. However, in this code here, I haven't referred to NumPy at all and I won't, okay? So I won't do this. So let's execute this piece of code as well and it should get the number two here. So nothing happened here, so it's number two. So now let's go on to the code. So now this is now initializing the weight. So what are the relevant changes here? The relevant changes are that before we were using these numpy.random.randn, but now we are using the original torch function. So I said torch is a full linear algebra library like numpy. Actually, when I implement something where I usually use numpy, I now use torch, right? Why? because sometimes I also want to have gradients and then I have them at my fingertips as I want. So you can really replace your work that you usually do with NumPy with Torch. There's some learning that you need to do. So I think the zeros matrix in Torch doesn't require a tuple, but can be called differently. And so there are slight differences, but you can get very quickly used to those. Okay, so this is just initializing the weights, but now using torch functions, let's do that. So that should get the number three. Yes, it did. And now let's look at the code for the training. So it looks like I didn't change so much. So I'm still doing a flatten here. Since there are 2D images, I want to have like a vector. 
And before I had like np.tonh, now I'm using torch.tonh. So the, um, the people who, the developers of torch, they had NumPy in mind and they kind of use very similar syntax. So you can just replace the NP very often just by torch, okay? And the rest of the operation stays the same. Um, what about this one? Also the outer product, we can just use this from the torch library. What else do we have? The rest stays basically the same. Um, and we can just execute the code. And let's see what's happening. Hopefully we don't get an error message. Yeah, it's just running like before. And the numbers are approximately similar. So they are not great. They are just going down somehow. So it's kind of working. But I think um, when we calculate the confusion matrix at the end, it's not super great. I think you tried it at home maybe. Let's look for the confusion matrix. What changes are there necessary? So before we initialized it with np dot zeros, and we had to put the sizes into a tuple. Yeah, so the uh, zeros in NumPy only takes a single parameter, but in Torch you can give it like a, a list of parameters, which I prefer actually. Okay, again here's the tangent superbolicus, which we put a torch in front. Then there was an arc max. <clears throat> I just replaced it with torch, so and it just worked. So it looks like they kind of followed the same syntax. Okay, let's see how far we got. Um, is it done already? Um, yeah, it's done. So let's calculate the confusion matrix. And um, yeah, it is it is okay. It's not looking super good. I think there should be an im show. Where's the im show? Oh, there it goes. So we get some material here on the diagonal. So some digits are working well. The ones are recognized very nicely. The twos are recognized very nicely, but sometimes we think they are six. Okay, that that's not ideal. Looks like many digits kind of get classified as sixes. Okay, so this works okay. We will see in later code that we also can get a nice diagonal. Okay, I will show you how. Basically, it's playing around with the shapes and having a diff slightly different network. Okay, so far, the only thing that changed is that we replace all the NumPy fun functions with torch functions, okay? Now let's use the, use the automatic differentiation. And there, my code here is a bit sketchy. So I tried to make some intermediate code, which is not using the torch conventions, but it's like in between to show you the meaning of these functions. But the code is not very good. So first of all, now we need to tell that the matrices like W1, B1, and so on, they're not only random matrices, but they will require a gradient. Okay, so think of these W1s as Python object that have a da data slot. Actually, they, they do, so let's execute this code and um, let's just look at them. So if I type in the W1, you get this tensor thing here, but actually I think the it's in some slot which is called data. So actually there are slots in here. Yeah, and there are different slots. Sometimes there's also like a gradient slot, but right now there's nothing in there. It's just already prepared, so it exists, but there's nothing in here because I didn't do any computation with it, okay? So the W1, B1, and so on, if they are torch matrices, they are not just pure matrices, but they're carrying additional stuff and additional knowledge. In particular, they carry the information, where did they come from? So they are basically forming the graph, the computational graph we've seen last time. So these, all these variables here, there will be nodes in a bigger computational graph that gets automatically generated once I'm using these functions in computa uh, these, uh, these objects in, when I use these objects in computation, then the graph is built automatically, okay? Okay, so, and then now we, we put now these operations here that we had so tangent superbolicus of this linear combination, blah, blah, blah. We call it a function. And we call this function here model, okay? So the model is basically our function that takes an x. And in this case, it has to take a lot of parameters. That is not very convenient. I just do it here for illustration purposes. So now what changes here? So the change is now, okay, my forward computation is just this function call. Now comes my backward computation. And now comes the automatic differentiation. So the automatic differentiation happens down here. So ignore this zero grad thing. So I will explain in a second what this is about. But 
Now, what I'm doing in each loop is I'm doing a forward computation just by calling my function. And now this function is using all these sophisticated torch objects that when you use them in computations, they store kind of where they're coming from and how they were computed. And then on the last variable that I get, in this, my, in this case, my loss, I say e dot backward. And what the e dot backward is doing, it will put the one into the computational graph and then back propagate through the whole graph and decorate all these variables here, all these objects with their gradient information. And this is doing it now completely automatically. And so why can it do it? Because we're not using these NumPy matrices anymore, but we are using the torch objects that are able kind of to trace their computational graph. So if you use these torch objects in these computations here, yeah, then in the background, basically these variables now carry information about how they were used. So this Z3 yeah, is an object that also has a slot about its parents. And the parents will tell it, okay, I depend on the B2, on the Z2 and on the W2, for example. And by knowing this, then when I do backdrop on the E, the E will know, okay, I depend on the R, fine. So let's send a message to the R that I now know my gradient. And then the R knows, okay, great. Thanks for the downstream gradient. Let me pass on, yeah, multiplying with the local gradients, the gradients for my inputs. And then it will pass on the information to Y and T, to all these objects and so on and so forth. So after calling E backwards, now the W1, for example, has now a new slot, the dot grad slot, and it contains in its dot data slot, basically the matrix that can be used for gradient descent. Okay, so in, in principle, this is the logic of the code, but it doesn't work somehow very well because I'm messing around with the PyTorch in a way that is not intended to. So typically, these steps also go into a function and they are hidden from the user. But the basic logic is like that. You do a forward computation, then you have the automatic differentiation, and then you can update all your parameters because now everyone knows locally its gradients. Of course, after the first round of the loop, the gradients are still there. So for the correct computation of the automatic differentiation, I need to zero them, okay? So that's why here's the zero, everyone, okay? So if there's a grad here, I need to zero them out before I'm doing the backward one. So why do I need this? The thing was um, a node could receive the, grade, the upstream gradient from different branches, right? So it could be that a variable is used at different locations. And for each of these locations, you get an upward gradient. I think at the beginning I said downward, but I meant the upward gradient, the one that's coming from the loss. Yeah, and it needs to accumulate all those. So an object like W2, doesn't know whether I've already used somehow the update and did all these things. When I call in the next iteration again, e dot backward, it would just increase and um, it, it would just add the new incoming gradient to the current gradient that it already stores because it would just think, okay, I got more messages. I need to sum them all up to compute my gradient. So for that reason, you need to zero them out by hand, okay? Of course, there will be functions and it's all hidden in something, but this is the, the logic that is happening. Again, you just do the forward computation, then you do the automatic differentiation, so going backwards through the computational graph and then you do the updates. And the code works so, so, so it's not working super stable. I think it's a bit buggy. It's here mainly for illustration purposes so that you know what's, what's happening here. So let me, flip further through a better version. So now let me show you how you actually would do it in PyTorch. Okay, the same network, but now actually implemented also in PyTorch style. However, ideally the code that I showed you before tells you what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so let me again reset my um, notebook here so that we can ensure that here's nothing going, going wrong. So let me execute the import of the libraries. So this should get the number one if I did everything right. And then here's the MNIST digits again loaded. Um, you see here's already a number three because I did this just before the lecture. Now, how is this model function now more cleverly or more easily defined in PyTorch? We can just say we have a sequential model. Okay, so there are some library functions 
in this case, sequential is a function that will generate us such a function model. However, it's not just this function model from before, but this function also knows everything about its parameters. So the linear layer that I'm using here, of course, has a weight matrix and it also has a bias matrix, but it's all hidden from the user, so we don't need see it. However, the model later on, it has a certain set of parameters. So let's maybe execute this maybe in isolation. Okay, maybe let me split this. Can I split the cell here? Yes, let me do this. So let's just execute this model thing. So to generate it. Okay, now the model is generated. And now let's look at it. So there's this model and it will just re repeat how it was generated. And now what does it contain? So it contains all the different layers that I want to do. So I start with flattening my 2D images. Then I apply my linear layer from 784 to 32 nodes and then the tangent superbolicus and then 32 nodes to 64 and then 64 to 10 nodes. Okay, so that's it. That's the sequence of operations that I'm doing here. However, there's other stuff in here. In particular, there's a list of the parameters. So let's look at it. Okay, it's a function, so let's call this function. So it tells me it's a generator object. Okay, great. So let me um, do a loop on that one. For P in model parameters, let's print it. Okay, so let's see what's happening there. And here you see now, here coming all these parameters. And those are exactly the parameters W1, B1, W2, B2, W3, B3. However, they of course don't have any nice names here anymore, right? Because they, I didn't gave them any names. I just told the system, um, okay, I want to have a sequential model with these layers and they do have parameters, but please hide everything for me. I don't care. I just later on want you to do the gradient descent. Okay, and you should hide that for me as well. So I don't want to see it. I don't want to mess around with it. Okay, so it's all stored here in this model. At the end, the model is, you can just use it like a function, right? So you can just call, put an X as an input and it will do the computation along the sequence, but it can do so many things more. Okay, so let's see now how does the next code look like. So for the loss function, um, we just take the um, MSE loss. So that's the mean squared error loss. That's the one that we also used before, but we computed it differently, we said, we have a residual and then we square the residual. And another way is we now define a function and this is again, like this torch and N sequential is generating us something more fancy. So the loss fn can be used as a function, but it's also carrying additional information with it. And um, now what about the optimization? So we can choose an optimizer and this is again, like generating us now an optimizer function that then can be used for the optimizing. So what is the optimizing? The optimizing is about doing basically the updating of the weight. So the updating of all the parameters. And here we use stochastic gradient descent. We give it the parameters that needs to be updated. So that those is just a generator. Here's a model dot parameters, bracket open, bracket close. That is the list of all the parameters that need to be updated and we give it a learning rate. And then the SGD is for stochastic gradient descent. Now, if I want to try another optimizer, like you might have heard about Adam, yeah, you just use the Adam like this, that's it. So you just replace the SGD with the Adam. And so it's very simple now to use different updates, right? So the, up, the SGD is just an update where you do gradient descent. The Adam is doing something more fancy. It's kind of accumulating information, and then renormalizing the gradients and doing something clever, which typically works very well. Um, in particular, it means if you come up with a new optimizer that does a better update, you just write such an torch.optim function with the right um, signature, and then you can just use it in your models that you already have. So now how does the training look like? So the training now got very short. So again, we pick a single example However, of course, we have to ensure the correct shapes and that's something one typically struggles a little bit, right? So in my first iteration, uh, I had it like this and then you get some cryptic error message from PyTorch that there's a shapes mismatch and blah, blah, blah. And um, then it, oh, can I get it back? Yes. 
then you fiddle around with it a while and then you find out it has to look like this. So why does it have to look like this? So typically these toolboxes are often about images and images are often color images. So it's kind of the most of these super convenient stuff like these sequential stuff and all these things, it's made for the following shape. The first dimension is about the number of data points that you feed in into the network. So you want to call model of this matrix XK and the first dimension is basically the number of elements you have in your batch of data. So typically the function model can, can compute like, uh, can process several images at the same time, a whole batch of images. So that's what the first dimension is about. Of course, that's important if you run the whole thing on a GPU. Yeah, you don't want to run your function like on a single example, but you want to run it simultaneously on a thousand examples and your GPU will do this in the same time as one example. The next dimension is the number of color channels. Yeah? Typically we talk about color images. So often you will have three dimensions here if you have RGB. And then we have the size of the image, which is in this case 28 by 28. Um, we have a fully connected network here. So actually these sizes really, they don't matter at all, but typically these functions, they assume that there's a color channel and then these sizes. Um, however, when you look at our first layer, we have this special layer at the beginning, the flatten layer. So this layer will just squash everything into one long vector. Okay, so the output of this one will be n by 784, where n is the size of the batch. Okay, so that is the output of this flattened thing. And then it goes on and on and on. Okay, so far so good. So the first thing I struggled with was getting the shapes right. Okay, so then we process and do the forward pass. So this is now calling our function. And now it looks like it doesn't have any parameters, but as I said, the model is not only a function that can be called, but it also knows about its parameters. Yeah, so it's really an extended function with, with more, um, more features. Then the output predictions here, yeah, it's a 10 dimensional vector. It gets compared with our target predictions, which are like uh, one hot encoded labels. Yeah, and we pass them into our loss function, which we got also from our toolbox. Okay, and we get a single digit loss. Okay, so a single scalar loss. So that is computed. And next, what we do, we set all gradients to zero. And for this, there's a function optimizer.0grad. So this will zero out all parameters. So now how does optimizer know which parameters needs to be zeroed out? It knows it because we gave it a list of all parameters. Okay, so the optimizer function here, or this optimizer object, it knows who to set to zero. Okay, and it will also check in the first iteration that there's nothing to do. So it knows what to do. So all the ugly code now goes into these nice calls. Next, we call loss.backward. Um, remember before it was e.backward because e was a scalar that we were computing. However, typically the scalar at the end is called loss. So we are calling loss.backward. And this is now doing all the backpropagation through the computational graph. So the computational graph gets generated by calling the mod model of xk and by calling the loss fn, right? So this is basically doing PyTorch computations using PyTorch objects that have like know their histories. They store which were the parent objects that were used for computation. Good, so this is doing the backward and generating all the gradients. And then I'm doing optimizer.step and that thing is doing now all the updates of the weights. Again, optimizer knows which weights to update because we gave it a list of them, okay? And now the code gets very nice and convenient. So now how do I get some nice outputs here? Of course, I can still print out the loss and here I need to loss.item. Oh, I forgot, is this still true? Yeah, whatever. Maybe this should also work if I just say like this. Yeah, let's try it, whether this works. And then let's check also on test data. So I'm now calling the model on all my test data. And again, the painful thing when you implement this are these weird reshapes that you need to do. So now I, again, I need to reshape my test images, which is like 10,000 by 28 by 28. I need to add this color channel dimension in here. Yeah, The minus one here means 
in the first dimension, take as much space as you need, okay, and it will be 10,000 at the end. Then take a dimension where there's only one entry, and then we have a 28 by 28 image. So this reshape is again something that is a bit painful. So I get the test predictions, I can compute the test error and print it out, okay. And again, here there are some subtleties. So this is um, a Boolean, yeah, this is a Boolean torch array, so where every entry is true or false. And in NumPy, we just went on and said dot mean. In Torch, it will yell at you and it would, will tell you, I don't know how to compute the mean of, of Booleans. And so you first need to do this conversion of with putting them into a float. Yeah, then the true gets one and the false gets zero. And you can calculate the mean on it. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's very similar. Okay, so let's run it. And <clears throat> ideally now, so the initial test error is 88%. So that means it's almost... Ah, it's, it's very random, yeah, only 10% or 12% is correct, which kind of corresponds to random. And then we go on and you see how it's nicely is going down here, this percentage. And I guess in my previous implementation that was there for illustration and where I can explain everything to you, um, there must be some bugs in there because now this is going nicely down. The luck here that I have now is that um, Lots of the possibilities for bugs are now hidden in here, right? So the optimizer knows whether to increase or to decrease the weights, right? It will just do the right thing. Again, also the backward computation, it will use just the right gradient. So there's no bug in there typically, right? They are tested, these gradient things. I only need to worry about the forward computation and even that one is automated, okay? So let me get rid of this block here. Or I can keep it in here, but let's remove the output. How do I do this? Current output, let's clear it. Um, so even writing the function kind of is totally simplified by using this sequential thing, okay? So I not even have to worry about parameters and all these things. So that's kind of all hidden from the user. I now only need to think about the architecture that I want to use, okay? And about the different layers. So in a way, um, this is a programming language, the stuff that I put into sequential, right? I can put here these new functions and then a lot of stuff is happening in the background, okay? So it's not only doing the evaluation like a usual compiler, but it's doing an evaluation and creating a computational graph that can be used for backward computations, for backpropagations as well. Okay, meanwhile, ideally this thing is already running nicely and we got 80 percent 80 percent is pretty good right i mean then we get already lots of things correct let's see how the confusion matrix looks like um so let's have an image of that one 18 percent on test data that's good and the confusion matrix now looks really good okay so this is really how we would like to have it Surprisingly, we didn't, didn't do any convolutional stuff that I haven't told you about or something. This is just a fully connected network. That's it, okay? So it's really simple. Nonetheless, on the MNIST, it works very well. Let's see for that one. I think it's the true nines are sometimes mistaken to be false, okay? And of course now, probably we can figure out how to look at them, right? Um, let me see. Let's let's give it a let, let's give it a quick try. Okay. So basically, we need to identify some. Shall we do it? Ah, uh, maybe not. Ah, uh, you want to see it? Maybe. So you want to see it? I will struggle a little bit, right? So okay, but I don't mind. So let's struggle a little bit. So let me try to show you these wrong ones. Okay. Let's find out about them. So first of all, I think. The first, this is a, uh, let's first check the entry. So that's the entry 519. So I just want to make sure that I'm really at the right entry, confusion, because sometimes images, they flip the axis and then I would try to visualize the wrong thing. So let me have a look at nine comma um, four, whether that is the right one. Okay, that is the right entry, good. So the nine and the four, so the first entry here is the true label and the second one is the predicted ones. Okay, so we need to find nines that get predicted to be a four. Okay, so let's first find the nines. 
Okay, so let's do that. So for this, uh, let's start with the Y test. So what shape does it have? So that is just the um, just a long vector of digits, right? So of of, the, of of labels. Okay, so I want to have the nines. So the nines are the ones where this guy is equal to nine. Okay, great. So of course, we should check everything that we do, right? So now I want to have a look at them because otherwise I'm kind of following something wrong. So let's see, how did I visualize my digits here? Let's um, flip up to here. Uh, maybe I should have practiced it beforehand. Nonetheless, this is more fun now. So, okay, plot digits was my function. So this is already Lynette. Okay, no, we are not there yet. We first want to find out what's wrong here. So how do the wrong digits look like? So here's my plot digit and I need to take the one from the test set. And now ideally I could just say I take the nines, okay? However, those are typically too many. So let me first restrict myself a little bit and just let's just look at the first 100 digits and then I take the indices that are nine, okay? So let's see whether that kind of makes sense. Plot digits not defined, oh great, okay, so perfect. So I should copy this function. So I don't want to have anything of the NumPy stuff from up. Oh, this is a NumPy function, uh oh. Digits gallery. Okay, but let's yeah, let's quickly do this. We know how to convert it. Okay, so this is a digits gallery function. Let's have a quick NumPy version of that one, uh, PyTorch version of that one. Okay, A. So let's plug in the code. So what do we need to ensure that the X will be a NumPy thing? So I think I can just do this. I just convert it. Once it's in there, I just convert it, okay? So that's just how I do it. So you see anything going on? Digits gallery of X, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this digit gallery will convert it, okay? So this is test code. So yeah, that should run then as well. If my implementation is correct, I should see some digits. And I see some digits. And I didn't say NumPy. I didn't say NumPy in my code. So that's good. I mean, I did say NumPy in my code, but I didn't change my functions here. Okay, great. So let's plot our nines from the first 100 examples. The shape doesn't work. Okay, great. So now I'm already running into problems. Did not match. Ah, okay. So that's the wrong way to do it. Of course, I need to take all nines. And now I just take from the nines, I take, let's say the first 20 digits. Okay, so that's the right way to do it. I take the first 20 nines. However, that doesn't work. Whew. So now what's wrong here? Nines is Y test B equal to R. Why doesn't it work? Okay, so let's try it before like this. So is it working like this? NP not defined. Okay, sorry, I have to do the import NumPy. It's getting a bit messy. But now it's doing something and it's plotting all the digits, which are nines. Wow, those are a lot. So how can I, can't I just say I want to have the first 20? So now maybe now it's working. No, it's not working. It does not match the shape of the index vector. Okay, whatever. So maybe some of you will have an idea what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, ah, okay, good idea. So let's try that. Okay, so you're saying I should put it in here, right? Okay, great. Wow, this is teamwork, very well. Thanks a lot. Perfect, so those are nines. Okay, so my, my code is working and I learned something about indexing here, so which is also great. So now let's find out which of these nines are wrong, okay? And for this, um, let's pass all the nines through our model, okay? So basically it's like that. However, there was this weird reshaping where I need to be careful. So let's do the reshaping correctly. So what reshaping do I need? I need to um, reshape it like this, okay? So approximately like that. Okay, so let's do that. 
So this is a reshape, but I have to put a minus one over here, right? To have the right sizes. And this is now my, um, let's call it ninth prediction. Okay, so that is how I compute my prediction. Great, and let's get rid of the plotting. Or let's say now, let's now try to, um, so this is the target, the ninth target prediction. And now we need to compare it with the true targets, right? So the true targets are um, t test nines. And I need to compare it whether they are not equal with the nines t predicted ones, right? So this, those are the right ones, right? Um, however, they will give me indices uh, I can, okay, I can say those are the wrong nines. And this will give me indices into the nines array, right? Here I'm taking all nines and taking all the ones. Those ones are all the predictions for all the nines. And I say everywhere, basically where it's true or false. So this whole thing gives me a long vector of truths and false. And this long vector of truths and faults I can use to index into my nines. Okay, so I get a shorter vector. And then here now I could say, okay, show me the wrong nines. So let's see whether they look, look wrong. Too many somethings in dimension one. So what am I doing wrong here? Too many indices. Okay, so let's this is not not right. By the way, just speak up if you see something. I don't mind. Um, okay, maybe I'm doing something. I don't need to compare with the T, but with the Y maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, I need to, ah, is it right? So where do I compute my, oh yeah, I need to compare with the Y. Okay, great, and not with the T. Oh, there are so many possibilities for bugs here. So let's try this one then. The size, blah, blah, must change, uh, blah, blah, blah. So still not right. So maybe let's do it step by step. So this is my, are my predictions, right? Great. So let's um, nines T prediction. So let's look at those. Ah, okay. So those are the ones oh, where I still need to do an arc marks on. So there's the arc marks missing. Okay. So those are um, just the, um, numbers. So let's do that. So how did I do it before? Ah, yeah. Okay. Just doing an arc marks along the one. Okay. Or how did I, did I do it for computing the error? So that might be closer to my code. Okay. Just on the prediction, I'm doing the arc marks and then I compare with the Y. Okay. Great. So let's see how to do this. Um, so those are my predictions, model, blah, blah, blah. And here I need to do now the arc marks. Okay, great. So this, the shapes still don't agree. So let's do it by hand. So this is the first thing that works. And now I'm doing the arc marks axis being equal to one. So what do I get out of this? Okay, I get a nice list of fours and nines and some fours. So that's kind of matching what we were seeing, right? There were some nines which were classified as fours. Was it like, that's what the problem was, right? Those are already here, some of them. Okay, great. So we're getting closer. Okay, now let's, let's try to select those. So these ones here, the nines, ah, I did it, no, did I do it? Arc marks one and that's where they are not the same so what's wrong here um okay let's first comment it out so this thing is a shape and it has length 1000 now uh, it has this shape okay y test of nines what about that one it has the same shape so now why doesn't it like it so Let's first do it like this. Then we have one intermediate step. Okay, that, that works. And what do we get? Okay, we get these true, false, false, and so on. So that's good. And now why can't we index into these ones? Can we? 
the shape blah blah does not match the tensor of ah okay so the shape is too large right uh, or too sm hmm, that's weird isn't it so why can't i do this any ideas oh the ninth was on all of them so okay i see so um the um the ninth is a vector of length 10,000 with truths and false, but it's not a vector of the indices. Okay. So now somehow I need to get back to the indices. So I have this, well, well, how do I get the indices? I now have a vector along the ninth. And um, uh, how can I do this? Um, Okay, so let's do it slightly different here now. Let's say we take all of them. So we get our all T prediction. We, we ask for everyone. Next, um, we only look at the nines. No, we only look at the ones that are wrong and that are nines. Okay, so we check whether a classification was wrong. Okay, and additionally, we want to have, now that's the ne next question that we need to figure out. We want to have that the Y test is equal to nine. Okay, so that is basically the criterion that we need to calculate. And those wrong nines could be used for plotting. There's also oh, there's a problem that the vectors have different lengths and they are not lists of indices, but they are having vectors which are trues and false in here. However, I'm wondering about this ampersand, what's the right function over here. So let's just see what's happening. So the ampersand of course is wrong and I somehow need some end function. So is it one? Tpred is not defined. Okay, so it's called all Tpred. And then it looks okay, fine. So let's see what's what's going on. So let's try to plot them. So those are the wrong nines, ideally. Okay, and this those are lots of nines. Okay, they, they look a little bit like fours. Um, let me not take all of them, but let's take look only at the first 100. Okay, then we should get a nice plot. Okay, colon 100. Hey almost no okay those are wrong nines yeah okay there is even one which got the wrong i mean this really looks like a four right i mean the other ones they don't look so much like a four to me so they actually look like nines i don't know looks like but now when i see it looks like these things they look like nines kind of yeah there's only one here i was hoping that there are more that really look like fours okay you see approximately how to do it okay so this is approximately how you would fiddle around with it to get the results i think this is not the answer if you find the answer how to do it right and this is wrong please post it on rocket chat i will include it into the code okay great so far, so good. So let's look back at our network that we had. Yeah. And let's see how we defined it. So in this nice toolbox now, we can have a sequential model where we just define the layers. And of course, you all heard about convolutional neural networks and all these things. So now how can we get something convolutional? And for this, I show you a couple of slides that will now explain more blocks that you can plug in here. And then we replace... Um, Basically, this sequence with another sequence that corresponds to Linet 5 from Jan Lequin, and we will see that the error goes down even further. Okay, now there's a question. Uh, do you know use the fast AI library? What do you think of it? Oh, I have no idea. No, I don't. I only use PyTorch. Okay, so there I can do everything I want. I'm sure there are zillions of other libraries. In particular, there's TensorFlow, and there's always a big debate of what's TensorFlow or PyTorch, which is better. Like the bottom line is, um, so the, the short answer to this TensorFlow versus PyTorch discussion is um, TensorFlow, I think, is more popular for deploying models in industry and PyTorch is more on the research side. Okay, so if you want to invent something new, you often use PyTorch, but if you want to deploy it like on a cell phone or elsewhere 
or like on industrial scale, then people often use TensorFlow. Okay, so that's the approximate thing. But um, it's a nice example of having competitors. So features where PyTorch excels they are very quickly adopted in TensorFlow as well and vice versa. Okay, so they are kind of competing with each other. And by this, always trying to be the best, coming up with new features, coming up with new stuff and copying from each other. Yeah, so at the end, I think for our purposes, it doesn't make sense uh, to choose one of them or, or to, to know both. So if we have one where we can do everything to understand about deep learning, then that's fine. And PyTorch actually is the one that is used in research and I think more used in academia. So that's the one we are following here. Yeah? And it's not worse or better than the other one. Then there are other libraries, probably like the fast.ai library that is mentioned in the chat. Um, these things are often also very interesting, but the most standard ones are PyTorch and TensorFlow. So if you write code and if you want others to be able to use your code, you should use PyTorch yeah, or TensorFlow, but use the one that is very common. And sometimes there are new libraries which have a new feature, which is like the super killer feature, which is much better than everything else and everything becomes super easy and it's a one-liner and great. yeah. Very quickly, the people from PyTorch will just take the feature and have it into their have it in their library as well. Okay, so these new innovations are great, yeah. But I wouldn't bet my code on it that I will be using it. So I stick with with one, and I am very rarely change the library. Okay, good. So let's look at other building blocks that we could have for our neural networks, and actually. Now, I'm referring to very old papers here because it's all have been said already. So there's this paper from Leon Boutrou and Gallinari, and the paper is called A Framework for the Cooperation of Learning Algorithms from 1991. Please have a look at them and say, oh, they all knew it already, okay? So and this is yet another example. So, so far, so good. So, so far, neural networks are sequences of computational blocks, and we've just seen the sequential function. However, in principle, yeah, we are computer scientists. Why not have all possible computer programs parameterized and then automatically tweaked, right? Why not? I mean, and this is the idea of this paper. So in principle, anything that can be written as a directed acyclic graph, okay, yeah, as a computational graph can be seen as that is a neural network. In particular, when you look at um, computational graphs that, that come out when you just have this simple sequential forms, depending on the granularity with which we are writing out the computations, you will get complicated graphs, right? So if you write out the matrix vector multiplications, for example, you get already quite a complete, uh, complicated network, okay? So it's not this simple feed forward one step after the other, but there's a lot of branching and things going on. So what are other what other things are computer programs than directed acyclic graphs, right? So suppose you write a program in Haskell or in one of these languages. Typically, some of the intermediate representations they create a computational graph for you, and then they compute along it. Yeah. So in Haskell, for example, you sometimes have infinite lists, and you might wonder, so how do they do these infinite lists? They represent them by computational graphs along which you can compute to generate as many examples as you want in a lazy fashion. So in similar, saying now any computer program that you write can be seen like a computational graph. So in any computer program, you can introduce parameters and you could do gradient descent. So the idea of neural networks, or let's call it deep learning, is super general. And it's really um, putting the usual programming we learn in uh, Programming 101, to a different level, right? So you add parameters to your program that are tweaked automatically from data. So this is a conceptual view that I have of machine learning and that basically neural networks are an instance of. So what kind of blocks are we, are we using here? And this is really like a Lego system, okay? So you need blocks that have a certain input signature and a certain output signature, and that's it. And then you can just build complicated stuff. And the nice thing is for each new block that you define, you need to define what's happening if I do the forward pass, what's happening if I do the backward pass. And once you define that, you're ready to go and you can combine it with all the other things. So let's look at the general form. So typically I would draw it like this. So the, the, the usual stuff that gets used for the computation got, comes from the left and the output goes to the right. 
and now from the bottom come some parameters. But of course, in principle, there's no distinction between the x and the w, right? It's just your definition that you say, I want to have a function that maps an x to a y that is parameterized by w. Of course, you could also say it's the other way around. I have a function from w to y that is parameterized by the x. So by saying who is the parameter, you are defining for the learning procedure what parameters to tweak with gradient descent. Okay, but there's no, no one holds you from doing the same for the x. And actually that's how things like this deep art where you generate images in Van Gogh style, this kind of stuff is are exactly doing that. They are twiddling around doing gradient descent with the input and not with the weight. Okay, so that's exactly flipping the idea. Okay, let's look at the details. So a way to write this would be y is equal to f of w comma x. And I really tried to write it super general. So I didn't put the w like a sub index to the f, but it's just yet another input to my function f. However, it's an input that I can automatically tweak. What do I need for the back propagation? For the back propagation now, I need to figure out how I can translate a gradient of my scalar valued loss. So this e here, yeah e like the end of the computation. Yeah, this is the incoming gradient that comes from the right. How can I transform it to get a gradient now for the inputs, in this case for the w? And the way to do it is just a chain rule. You multiply the incoming gradient with the uh, local gradient, where local now means what is the gradient of y with respect to w? That's it. That's something that is only about my function f. It has nothing to do with the loss function, nothing to do with anything else. And equivalently, I can do the same thing for the x. However, here, now this w thing, since this is my parameter, is used to update my w, and I can do it kind of after collecting all incoming gradients. And the gradient with respect to x is typically sent to the previous block and it's not used for the update of w or for the update of x, right? However, there are situations where you would update the x. As I said, in this deep art example, think of Van Gogh um, modifying and a photograph you take. So this is basically all we need to specify when we specify a new block. Okay, and on the following pages, let's write down expressions. So in a programming language or programming library like PyTorch, typically what you do when you invent a new block is you are implementing this function here and you not even worry about the back propagation functions. Why not? Because for the implementation, when you only use PyTorch function for which we know already the back propagation, then you get the back prop for the Y for free. So if the F is not doing anything complicated, but only using functions that are already implemented in PyTorch itself, then you get the gradients for free and you don't even have to do something complicated. However, sometimes suppose for a while the Fourier transform was missing and that's one of my favorite functions that I always want to have when I do computations. It wasn't there in the PyTorch, so you couldn't use it for backpropagation. And then you had to do it yourself. So you need to specify the forward computation. And how do you do it? Okay, you need to transform the x into maybe NumPy format and then you import some Fourier transform library from NumPy, you apply it and then you compare, uh, convert it back into the torch format to pass it back as the output. Okay, and then for the backward pass again, you needed to take a sheet of paper. So what is the derivative of the Fourier transform and you have to figure that one out by hand and implement it by hand. Okay. Um, now it's included. However, sometimes if you have a super exotic function that you want to have, right? So suppose this function is calculating the travel salesperson solution or something, yeah, whatever you name it, yeah, then maybe the gradient is something that is not included yet because you're doing some weird operations in here, which are non-standard. And then you have to come up with the local gradients yourself, okay? Good, so here's a simple example, the linear block. So here's the parameter is our big weight matrix W, in comes a vector, out goes a vector, and the forward propagation is just this equation. Um, this is how we write down the mass. In code, often the X is multiplied from the left because every row is a data point in a batch, okay? But those are just minor details. Don't get confused. For me, like when I write mathematics, I write it like this. When I write code, I do it the other way around. Actually, the x 
times w so the other way around also matches nicely here reading from the left to the right so it's kind of yeah so the x is on the left in this case and then comes the w but whatever what about the back propagation for the back propagation now the local gradient here is the x for the w and it's the w for the x okay and please be careful with the sizes over here yeah so that's always the challenging part that you need to be careful with the sizes. So the way I wrote it down here was that the W gets multiplied from the right with the vector. And that means that now my incoming gradient, which is a vector like this Y, gets multiplied from the left with the W. So this corresponds to doing a W transpose times the gradient of the Y. So here's the gradient the, or this partial derivative of e with respect to y, that will be a row vector, right? So otherwise it doesn't make sense to multiply it from the right with the matrix. But I haven't went into the detail here, what are the shapes? So please be careful when writing these things up, what the shapes are. In particular, this one is a weird thing. So did you vectorize the w or did you keep it as the size of the matrix? So it's not so easy to write this these things up, but it's easy for the chain rule. That's why I'm using this notation over here. Right? But typically you have to do a couple of reshapes. Here comes the bias la uh, layer. Maybe you thought, ah, oh, this probably includes a bias. No, it didn't. Let's have a let's have a block for it, right? It's so simple. Let's define a new block. So the block is just y being equal to x plus b. And the gradient is super simple, right? The gradient with respect to b is just one. Yeah, so we just take the incoming gradient, we pass it on. Does it make sense? Yes, the shape of y is the same as the shape of x. So the incoming gradient will have the same shape as the outcoming gradient. So it, it's prop properly working like this. And similarly, the gradient for the x, okay? So it's also has the same shape. Oh, this one was the one for the b. Good, next one, tangent superbolicus. Um, Again, this is the implementation. So it could be np.tanh, for example, or torch.tanh. And this is the gradient. Now, this follows from our little formula that basically the derivative of my tangent superbolicus function is uh, 1 minus the tangent superbolicus squared. So let me write it to the board once. So if um, the f of x is equal to tangent superbolicus, of x, and let's say they are all scalars for simplicity, then the derivative of that one is one minus tangent superbolicus x, and I don't know, some people like this notation, I actually hate it, so let's write it like that. So it's one minus tangent superbolicus of x squared, okay? And luckily, this guy here is already calculated, it's, it's y, so that is the one that we know from the forward pass. So if we properly implement our objects here, then when you do the forward task, it's not just computing y and then passing it on. Instead, it's storing it because every block typically also gets backpropped. And so for the backprop, then you can take your stored result and without much computation, you can spit out the gradient here. You might wonder what is this diagonal thing here going on? So this is just a dot multiplication, right? So let me show you on the board. So since it's a component wise derivative, um, if you have something like, um, uh, let's say, let's say in code, it's V times W, which is like the component wise multiplication. It can be also written like a diagonal matrix where I put the V onto the diagonal, and then I do a matrix multiplication with the W. That's the same thing as doing that one, okay? So it's just a component-wise multiplication. That's why I have this dike here. Of course, you will never implement it like that, right? Why? Because this is super expensive to generate the super large matrix. Instead, you just do the dot multiplication as well. So this is, again, the Hadamard product. Good, so far so good. By the way, please, Please interrupt me if I'm, um, oh yeah, I didn't show you the slide. So the DAIC, you never implemented like this. You implement it with a star, which is just the Hadamard product. Please stop me if there's something unclear, but I think this should be pretty clear what I'm showing you here. Okay, here's a logistic block. It's a one divided by one plus e to the minus squared. And again, 
This is the sigma of x times 1 minus sigma of x. Again, we are reusing the result from before. And it's a component-wise nonlinearity. That's why we have this diagonal thing or this Hadamard product over there. Okay, Relu, what about that one? So one notation is maximum of x and 0, where x is a whole vector and 0 then is the corresponding vector. Another way to write it is with the Iverson brackets, so for all positive ones, times x. So you basically check whether you're positive. If yes, you get a 1 times x, otherwise you get a 0 times x. Okay, so that's a convenient way because now this, is an, this allows us easily to calculate the derivative of the thing. So the derivative is, is just this Iverson bracket. So you just need to make sure when you pass on the x through the relu, you need to make sure that you store the result of the maximum and that you remember which values were zeroed out and which were not zeroed out. Okay, And that is then that gets then passed on when you do the backpropagation. Next, convolutional block. And now the convolutional block might be something uh, that you don't know. Maybe you don't know what a convolution is. So I will tell you on the board. But it also fits our image here. Um, in comes now, let's think of an image. Then we have several filters. I will explain in a second what that is. And out goes several filtered images. So think of this as a single color channel, and after filtering you have k color channels, okay, where color really has nothing to do with RGB or something. They are just called color channels because they are, act like a third dimension. So written as a convolution, so this is a new star here, and there's also backpropagation for it, where I didn't spell out the formulas, but let me first tell you what it is. So what is the convolution? So suppose you have an image, okay, with five by five pixels, or how many is it? Something like that, six by five pixels. And now one thing is you could multiply the whole thing with a long vector, right? So this is six by five. So I can vectorize this guy. So let's say I vectorize it. And then I could say, okay, let's take a linear layer. Okay, so let's call it W. So that would be a linear operation on the image. Okay, where in this case, my input would be 30 and my output I can freely choose. So I could, for example, say, okay, let's say I want 10 outputs. And now in each row of W, I'm having 30 numbers, which in principle I could reshape to such an image. Okay, so in principle I'm having here 10 images like that, and I dot multiply the whole thing with it, okay? Now, how could I use it? For example, I could have something where I'm having like, um, everywhere I have zeros, but I have ones up in this corner here, okay? And now if I would dot multiply this guy with that one and sum everything up, yeah, then the first component of the output of my y um, will check whether in this region there is something, right? Because I'm dot multiplying it with that one. And I could have another one maybe that has only ones down here. And then that one would check whether there's something going on down here, okay? So this is kind of checking whether here's something happening, this is something checking whether something down here is happening. However, the shape here maybe that I want to look for is always the same, okay? Maybe I'm always looking like for a single pixel or maybe for three pixels next to each other or something with a certain shape. So the idea of having a filter is to say, okay, let's have a smaller matrix, let's say a two by two matrix, which I don't know, maybe I'm looking for this weird looking shape. And now instead of having a bigger matrix where I have it at different locations and then I need one row for each of those, let's say I'm having just this small matrix and I'm moving it over the whole thing, okay? And by moving it over the whole thing, what I can do is now, I can kind of detect the circle, or let's say I'm having here this shape and I'm having it over here, okay? I can detect it anywhere in this matrix. So I'm moving it over the whole thing, and at some point maybe it will trigger 
and moving on and at the down here it will also trigger so if i do the convolution with this filter now yeah so this will be x star f i will get another image that will react to this shape so i will get a yes over there and i will get a yes maybe down here okay of course, there will be also partial overlaps. So this guy might be partially overlapping yeah, when I'm over here, up here with this thing. And so I get some smaller numbers here like next to it, okay? So this can happen. However, then next I'm doing a tangent superbolicus or something. And by this, I'm really thresholding it. And now I'm having here single pixels. So now what did I get? I kind of have with this filter, I can recognize shapes, yeah? Actually, the field machine learning is very related to the field of pattern recognition. And this is now a classical way to recognize a pattern here, right? However, what patterns are useful to classify digits, I don't know before. So let's learn these filters. So let's learn the shapes of these filters that are useful. However, maybe the shape sometimes appears up here, sometimes over here in the training data, but in the test data also over there. Then by instead of learning now these fixed locations for the shape, I only learn the shape and I do a convolution that goes over the whole image. And if there are certain shapes which were useful in the training data, I will be also able to recognize them later on if they appear down here. Okay. So that is basically a convolution that you have a large image and you move a small image over this one at every location and what's now happening at every location. So I'm putting the filter here. I'm doing the dot multiplication over there as if everything else is zero and I get a number here. Then I move my filter on to the next location and I can compute the next number and so on and so forth. In particular, this is not so different from what we just said with the linear operation. So now let's again Think about the whole thing, but now one dimensional. So let's say my x is a long vector. Now, what does convolution here mean? It would mean that I will take, for example, these two numbers. I dot multiply it with the filter, and I take the next one, and I take the next one, and I take the next one, and so on. Okay. And for each of these combinations, I'm calculating a number. At the end, what I'm doing is, is nothing else than a matrix vector multiplication, but one where the matrix has a certain shape. So let's write it as a matrix vector multiplication. So I'm having x star my filter f, where this thing might be, let's say, a, a hundred um, times one vector. And this might be a two by one vector, so a small filter, or maybe let's say a three, three by one. Then I can also view it as a matrix times my vector x by now only having entries at these locations here, okay? So now this thing is basically my f transpose and this is as well f transpose. So it's a matrix where in each row I'm having the same entry here, okay? However, this is nothing else than w times x where I'm very restricted in what I can do in the w. So in a normal layer, you would have a W where you could fill around with all parameters. Here you have a W, which is a function of some filter F. And if I change the first entry of the F, I'm simultaneously changing all these entries here on the diagonal. And if I change the second entry of the F, I'm changing all these entries over here, a little bit shifted. So a convolution is nothing more than a linear layer yeah, where I'm now, where I'm very restricted in what I can do, where there are lots of zeros in my transformation matrix. Okay, so now in particular, I could have several of those. So I could have F1, F2, F3, and that will give me like several of these convolution matrices. In particularly, my output then will have also several channels. Okay, so each of them is giving me a new vector. Each of these, so here's the fourth one, and they will generate me now several color channels. 
And the parameters are the filter coefficient, so for example three numbers, or three by four numbers in this case, and they are at the end just a complicated or a particular linear operation, which is um, follow, following the idea of pattern recognition, that I want to learn a pattern, yeah, which is contained in the filter, that I want to detect anywhere along the image, or along the vector in this case. And of course now doing the right reshapes and everything, you can also have an image where you, um, where the input is an image, so the x could be an image and you do a convolution with several filters, okay, so those are all my filters, you do the convolution and the output will be several, how many did I make? That many. So the output will be several images, okay, so that might be my single digit in one color channel and I apply five filters to it, so I will output five color channels at the end, okay, and of course my input could have already three color channels and then if I do this I have even more, in this case I would have 15 of those, okay. Why is it like clever? Because now of course this might be the input channel with three color channels, I do a convolution, I learn these filters here, those are not too many numbers, I'm getting these 16 color channels or 15 and that again is then inputted into the next convolution which then generates maybe a hundred color channels, right? And so on and so forth. However, a convolutional layer is just a linear operation. So it is a special case of y being equal to w times x. Yeah? So a convolutional layer is a special instance of that one, where the w here is parameterized by filters, let's say f1, f2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it is just a linear operation where I'm using a particular matrix. So what does it buy me? It buys me this intuition about finding patterns in my image, so I'm maybe looking for edges or whatever, you name it, and you can learn these things in the same way as you can learn the entries of a fully connected layer, one where I'm kind of having a full matrix W. The other thing that it buys me is if this is like an M vector and this is an N vector, uh, let's see, um, then how much is it to do the computation? I think it will be M times N, okay, or let's say they have the same size, so it's just N squared, and the convolution can be done in N log N. So it's also that the convolutional layer can be computed much faster than the fully connected one. And it has much fewer parameters, of course. Yeah? So if this is a megapixel image, a fully connected layer would have a million columns, okay? And then maybe if the output is also a megapixel image, it will be a million times a million. So it will be super expensive to do the computation and to, for the storage. If you do a convolution with a megapixel image, maybe you only have like eight by eight filters or something, and you have 10 of them, fewer parameters, and the computation can be done in n log n, which is a million times five or something, okay? So convolutional layers uh, have a very nice intuition for the pattern recognition idea, and they are computationally much nicer. Of course, now, I didn't draw down the, the derivatives, but we can just use the formula that we had for that one, and basically it involved like the W transpose matrix for calculating the gradients. And now you just need to think of, so if the W matrix is something like, like this, the W transpose matrix is something like that has the filter in here, but now if you carefully look, you will identify the filter again, also in the rows, and this operation can be also implemented in n log n, so both can be done super fast. And both are instances of a general point of view on convolutions, okay? So far so good maybe? So this is convolutional layer, it's an idea of being super fast and being aligned with the idea of pattern recognition. <clears throat> 
Here's another one, max pooling that is often used to reduce the dimensionality. And again, it's a linear layer, yeah? So what linear layer is that one, the max pooling or the, the average pooling layer, for example? <clears throat> Let's look at an example for the 1D case. So suppose this is your vector and you want to do an average pooling, you just filter with these entries. So before we were we having learnable filters that can be tweaked arbitrarily and now we just set them to a half and a half. <clears throat> so we can just move over the whole image and average basically neighboring pixels. This wouldn't reduce the size, but if I omit that one, having a so-called stride of two, so calculating a filter here and then moving not one pixel down, but two pixels down, I'm having a two, uh, I, I having now jump of two, and then the next filter, and again a jump of two, yeah, then this thing will reduce the size a lot. At the end, it will turn out that also this operation can be written like a matrix times x, where this matrix now, it, it will contain fewer rows and columns, and it will just have non-overlapping entries along the diagonal. Again, this can be computed super fast, okay? I think even in O from N, so we don't even need this log N, so it's even faster. And since we know already for a linear layer how to do everything, you need to think about how to implement the detranspose. Yeah, and that's again something that can be done super fast. <clears throat> okay, so that is the downsampling. And the downsampling, you can think of many operations. So you can average, for example, neighboring pixels. You can take the maximum or you can take the median. And for each of them, of course, you need to come up with the derivatives. Here's another block. So, I mean, this is not a block that you usually see in neural networks because you typically stop at the Y, right? So your computation will extract something and then those are the scores for the different classes. But the square loss block can be also just seen like a block in a bigger computation which has derivatives and so on and so forth. So also the squared losses can be included into the computation. And as we've seen in the implementation before, that's also how we did it. We had this loss function, which was also part of the computation. Then from the loss, we were starting the backward pass. So at the end, it's not part of the solution, but it's very convenient to have it in here for writing everything down. Here's another one, the softmax loss. That's yet another one. That's another way to compute a single scalar from your labels that you get out of this, okay? Just another function. Let's go to the next one. So a neural network can be a sequence of these bricks that I've just shown you, or we can also have a more complicated graph. So, and here you can be super creative. You can create whatever you want, okay? So really it doesn't matter. It can be anything. Good, so far so good. Let's have a quick look at some famous examples. So a super famous example is Lynette, which I show you in a second in the notebook. So that is now a notebook that takes here some input image. Here it's 32 by 32. I think our MNIST digits, they are always 28 by 28. But let's see what the operations are. So this is a single color channel. And then we use a convolution where you see this is now the size of the filter, okay? And the size of the filter, I think, is something like three by three in this example, because we will end up after this operation with 28 by 28 images. Yeah, remember when you do a convolution, if, if this is my image, the green one, yeah, and now I would move a filter along it, and I only take the one where I'm inside the image, yeah, then I will stop at the corner. So in principle, I could also go here, but if I always do a convolution where my filter is completely included into the image, then the image will get smaller, the larger the filter is. And so from this 28 by 28 size, we can infer the filter size, I think to be three by three. That's a plus minus one issue here. Okay, and we get six of them because we learn six filters here. Okay, so we, we, we learn six filters simultaneously and that are generating six layers, uh, six color channels. Um, then we do some subsampling and it also looks like a convolution, but basically it could be like a max, so-called max pooling or it could be a mean pooling where we take the maximum at, uh, 
some quadrat of four pixels or we take them, the mean of them. And we get like six color channels of half the size, now only 14 by 14. Next again, again a convolution with some filters and I think these are five, or again three by three filters. Okay, and but we have 16 of them. Ah, not 16, but... Ah, okay, there are some convention that I haven't told you. We have 16 filters, that's why we get 16 color channels. And again, some subsampling. And then we do a reshape, reshaping all of these different color channels that are already now very small images, and we're transferring them into a long vector and applying a couple of fully connected layers, which are basically just linear layers with some nonlinearity in here. And this is the Lynette one. And that was developed by Jan Lequin, Leon Boutou, who we also just seen as one of the authors, and some others at AT&T, which is like was a big telephone company in the US. And it was used for, for a decade to read the digits of uh, on US checks. So as you know, in the US, it's very popular to write a check when you pay something. And they were automatically read by these networks. So it had some commercial um, success already, these deep learning methods. And there's a nice demo when you click on this link. Here's a more recent one from 2012. It's a so-called AlexNet. And again, you have some input image in this case with three color channels. So it's a color image. The image is much larger, 224 by 224. And then we have 11 by 11 filters to calculate the next layer. And here we have 48 color channels everything gets larger, then again some max pooling to get smaller again, and so on and so forth, at the end some dense layers. So basically the same architecture as Lynette, and that one was used for the ImageNet competition, and it was a breakthrough work where they were showing with these kind of networks, we could learn a classification problem with a thousand classes much better than all the methods before. Yeah, so there's the so-called ImageNet classification, which contains lots of different images, and you should classify them right from a selection of a thousand classes. So there are very lots of different breed of dog and different animals and planes and cars and so on and so forth. So it's a super complicated thing. And it was a driving force, this ImageNet competition behind the deep learning revolution, I would say, beginning maybe with these AlexNet from 2012. Um, these authors, uh, the, also, Geoffrey Hinton is one of the big names here. I think he also got a Turing Award for his work together with Jan Lequin and Joshua Benjou, who were like pioneers in this field. You might wonder, so what is the stuff that is going up here and the stuff going down here? So there the story is that, um, so these Kishevsky, Satskeva and Hinton, they wanted to make a neural network as large as computationally possible for them. And they had two GPUs. So this architecture here was made as large as possible so that it just fits on the GPU. But on a single GPU fits only the bottom part and they had a second GPU available where they put the second part on. So it's running in parallel on two GPUs to do the final computation. So they wanted to have a really large model and wanted to show that this can learn this ImageNet stuff. Okay, so this famous example I want to show you in code and then I'm done for today. So basically now what we're doing, we're taking the same code that we had here before, and now we are just replacing the sequential model with the Lequin model, okay? And let's do that. I have already copy and pasted the code down here. So where do I have it? Okay, here comes the Lynette stuff. And here I'm just replacing our simple fully connected network with the network from Lynette. And so now here we have to be careful with the sizes. That's why I spelled them out in the at the back. So the first is a convolutional layer. And now it says one input color channel. It will have six output color channels and it will use filters of size five by five. Okay. And okay, it's, it's not three by three, it's five by five. Then comes a ReLU uh, layer and a max pooling layer, which is kind of halving the size. So from 24 by 24, we go to 12 by 12. Next, we have a convolutional layer from six to 16 color channels with filters of size five by five. So the output will be 16 by eight by eight. 
again the relu, again the max pooling. Then we do flattening, so we flatten our 16 color channels that are now only images of 4x4 into one long vector and apply a couple of linear layers to the end. And the rest of the code that we had before stays the same, okay? And now this is very nice because we can play around with the parameters, just depends on how large our computer is, how large our model can be, right? You could get rid of one of the convolutional layers, you can study whether the performance changes and all these things. So I ran the code beforehand and here the, the, the error goes down very nicely. Already after 4,000 iterations, we have already an error of 23% and it's going further, further, further down. I don't run it again here now, but it's going down here to about 5% error, okay? Which is much better than the network that we looked at before, okay? And also here we can look at the confusion matrix and here the confusion matrix really looks nice. In particular, all these fours or the nines, which were like wrongly classified as fours, they are now correctly classified here, okay? So I think the code should run. So it should just run when you run it into your um, browser. There might be bugs still remaining, but I mean, this is really an output that I run just before starting the lecture. However, it took a while. So I don't know, it takes like five minutes or something to do this computation. Good, so far so good. I think that's the end for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. On Wednesday, we will have another lecture where I haven't decided the topic yet. I think we won't start with Gaussian processes. I think we will have something intermediate, some interlude or something. So let's see, I will prepare something. Thanks a lot for your attention and we see each other on Wednesday. Bye bye.